Niall. He's our um, MTT program steering committee chair, as well as SCI Asia Center uh, directors to give us uh, a few uh, welcoming remarks. Uh, now the floor is yours. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, if I look up, I can't see anything with them on, and I can't see anything when I'm reading with them off. But um, age is a terrible thing. But look, it's a, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you all here. I know there's uh, a lot happening this week, so we're very grateful to have the company of so many people here today. Um, I want to welcome a couple of guests just as we're starting out. We have our, obviously, uh, DFAT and our supporters for the MTT Alliance. I see Dwight is over there. Um, we have board members from SEI, who it's a privilege for us to have you here present today, so thank you for coming. Per is here in front. And we have Chantana, who's also the chair of the steering committee for uh, the SummerNet program. So great to have you here as well. So, but as my position as the chair for the MTT, um, it's very good to have everybody here today just to start kind of looking at how we can bring the MTT alliance forward. And I think, as we said in the overall program approach, we wanted to look at the MTT alliance is to try and gather all of the members and the partners of both the MTT program, the MTT alliance, SummerNet, and any other interested parties to try and come together for the development of this future MTT alliance. So quite a bit of bringing actors together, key stakeholders who can help drive the policy agenda. So I think it's really important that we think through how we can do that. So I think it's important that, you know, building on the great start that we've had with the MTT program, um, we've had a good discussions earlier this morning between the steering committees of both programs and the keen willingness and intention to try and combine these programs in the future, all going well. Um, we've seen the strong foundations that have been built across all of the research from SummerNet, all of the research within the MTT, and the strengthening of policy engagement that's happening as a result of both of those programs. That's leading to more local, national, and beginning to see more regional level policy dialogue. And that's really encouraging. And I think through the course of the next hours or so, we're going to see some kind of key case studies, key learnings from the programs to date, some of the highlights that we, we have um, developed through these research studies. But we want to continue to see how we can focus on the policy engagement and really looking at impact at scale from the work that we're doing. So a little bit more of how do we increase capacity development and support to partners to really drive uh, engagement so that we can enhance policy dialogue, we can enhance kind of policy impact and start to support more on the ground. How do we drive greater inclusivity in all of that process? How do we ensure that we're listening to the communities and all the key stakeholders and integrating their thoughts and their desires into these programs? How do we drive gender and social equity? How do we drive disability and the support for disabled people into these programs? It's, we have to make sure that it's all inclusive. So it's a challenge to bring all of this together, but if we can do this in the process of co-production, working together in that inclusive manner, we're listening to what the people want, we're listening to what is needed on the ground, and we're hopefully influencing policies that can support that in the long term. So over the course of the next uh, few hours, I think we're here until about five o'clock, we hope to hear an engaging kind of interactive discussions. Please feel free to speak up and give some feedback when the time is right, so that we can hear from everybody here to how we strengthen the MTT Alliance, how we build it towards the future. And just as a aside, SEI itself has been here for 20 years. We're celebrating that on Wednesday. We're almost 20. Um, we want you to enjoy, hopefully, thinking through how this alliance can support the region for the next 20 years. How do we really build upon all of the connections, the partners, and the contacts that we have to drive for long-term sustainability in the region? So it's really up to you, and it's in your hands. So really, just to say uh, thanks for everybody joining us. We look forward to future learning and discussions and challenging us to, to achieve what the MTT Alliance is set up to do. So thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Nal, for your um, welcome remarks. Now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Twice. He's a senior program manager from the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, or in short, DFACT. Uh, from Australian Embassy Thailand. Uh, twice the floor is yours. Thank you, Nian. Swadi Kap for our friends from Thailand, Arun Susdai for our friends from Cambodia, 
Sabay di for our friends from Laos and Sinchao for our friends for Vietnam. Maybe I should learn how to say good afternoon in Sweden later on. But thank you very much, as, as Niall mentioned, thank you very much for joining us this week. This is actually a very exciting week ahead. This is just the first day. Tomorrow we will have the Mekong Think Tanks Policy Forum. On Wednesday, we will have the Regional Climate Roundtable. And on Thursday, capacity building for our fellows and other partners. As I've said earlier, um, this is a very exciting week uh, as we continue to strengthen the partnerships that we have in the region. As you know, Australia has a long history of engagement in the Mekong sub-region. We are invested, engaged, and committed to the prosperity and sustainable development of not just the Mekong sub-region, but of uh, Southeast Asia in general. As some of you may be aware, in 2020, the Australian government announced the Mekong Australia Partnership, or as we call MAP, and this is where Mekong Think Tanks is um, housed under. So the objective of the Mekong Australia Partnership is to strengthen local capacity in the region to address transboundary challenges, including climate change, water security, um, gender equality, disability, social inclusion, or uh, what we call GEDC, economic resilience, and lastly, combating transnational crime. Um, the work that we do with SEI is very important and very timely. As I've mentioned earlier and this morning um, during the discussion, during the PSC meeting, we do value the importance of, lo uh, of listening to, locally, to local voices and to amplify their voices in the, in the right platforms. This is in line with our objective to shape more inclusive and more effective policies in the region. Through this program, as, as you may be aware, uh, Mekong Think Tanks are funding uh, regional and local organizations and universities uh, for locally-led researches. I know that we work with AIT on two flagship studies. We work with SEI on one of our flagship studies and ADPC on um, addressing urban heat. These are very crucial um, researches, and we also support seven rapid response researches from major university to some universities in Vietnam uh, and a lot, of others, or a lot of other organizations, all of which or all of whom are here today. Um, we are also proud to elevate the support of Mekong Think Tanks with the young fellows. Uh, can I see the hands of the fellows, the Mekong Think Tank fellows? Right, uh, so all of them are, um, I think most of them are, are here. And under our fellowship program, we hope to build the capacity of young researchers and be exposed to on-the-ground research to policy activities under this program. As you know, there's a lot of challenges translating researches into policies, and it is our hope that through this fellowship program, the young generation of thought leaders and change makers in the region would be able to understand and help us in the long term. Finally, I would like to thank SEI. Uh, congratulations. On I know we'll, we'll be celebrating your 20th anniversary on Wednesday, but allow me to congratulate the SEI team for your um, hard work in the last 20 years, and we hope to see you more for maybe more 20, 20 more years. And of course, I would like to acknowledge Sweden and the foundation blocks that they have built through SummerNet. Um, I, I also would like to recognize Dr. Chantana as, as the head of the steering committee of SummerNet. Summer, even before I, I joined DFAT, I was already aware of what that um, SummerNet is. I'm not originally from the Mekong region, but I, as I've said before many times, I consider myself as a, as a son of the Mekong region because I've been here for, um, I don't want to say my age, but I've been here for about 15, 16 years. So I started my career in Myanmar. I started and then continued on here in the Mekong sub-region. So early on, I recognize the importance and the work, the important work that SummerNet is doing. Thank you very much also to Chulalongkorn University for co-hosting event and of course to the government of Thailand for graciously hosting us this week. And finally, thank you for everyone. Uh, thank you for your time, and thank you for taking your time to join this Im very important gathering. As a final note, I, I would just like to highlight that in the last couple of weeks, we have seen how climate change has affected the lives, everyone's lives, you know, the, the floodings in Northern Thailand, the floodings, uh, no, the destructions that happened in Vietnam, even in the Philippines. So 
our work is very crucial and our work is very important. So I do hope that in the next couple of days, we continue to share our knowledge and insights and we look forward for your active engagement, not just this week, but beyond. Thank you very much. Thank you very much twice for the uh, welcomes and also for having been our very close partners. Um, so now I would like to invite uh, Professor Dr. Chantana. She's the Sustainable Mekong Research Network, or you hear more often at Sumanet. Um, she's a steering committee chair. Um, Ajahn Chantana, the floor is yours, please. Sawadika. Oh, that's good. <laughs> um, as a resident of Bangkok, we'd like to welcome you all, members of uh, MMT, uh, Summonet, uh, SEI, and uh, also friends who support us. Uh, Summonet is approaching its 20 years. So we have passed our puberty. Now we are grown up and we feel confidence. In the past 20 years, you can look at the board behind, we have been a pioneer of linking policy and research. We have uh, been implanting through our capacity building in uh, human rights based conflict sensitivity and also gender e equality into uh, our research projects. We, uh, at this uh, age, we uh, somehow look young. <laughs> Young because we have, in the past uh, couple of years, we have two young fellows in our uh, steering committee. And we have also a new program on uh, summoned young professional. So we will look younger as we grow older and we become more energetic, I suppose. Uh, today, I think we are uh, at the another critical conjunction, uh, the flood in the northern Thailand uh, is not an ordinary flood. It's people call it a hundred years flood. It's a mud stream, and it look like something that we never seen before. So uh, I think it's our task is not done yet. Our research uh, have to face uh, more. Uh, regional dynamic, and uh, I think uh, the task is bigger. And today, I think it's very important that we are now joining hands with our, our friends, Alliance. MTT was invented uh, last year, and I, th I think it's to help accelerate the policy impact that so far uh, based on knowledge and evidence-based. I, I hope that uh, this event will uh, allow us to get to know one another deeper and uh, we can uh, freely exchange our ideas on a new step and we will walk hand in hand to see a better future for our region. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Chantana. So now, um, for all of us here who are the Alliance member, um, all, all in news, um, we would like to give you a bit of an update on our progress. Um, so I would like to invite Dr. Chayanis. Um, She's a MTT program director, component one lead, as well as a summonet program director to give a section on introduction of the MTT Alliance meeting and progress on our Alliance establishment. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nyan. And I'm so happy. The first, I would like to say a big thanks to my colleagues that you make microphone accessible. So because uh, anytime in the past, I have to step up or climb down, but this is really one of the example how JETC is very important, you know? We also need to consider like difference among us here. And I'm so happy because uh, today 
we really see many friends, and I would say our friends and family become bigger. And this really reflecting why we are here, because we have the same common interest and the passion to really work together to ensure that any future decisions made that impact everyone here will be based on the fact, evidence, based on reality. Whose reality is the reality that every one of us here can contribute, conveying, making seen by the decision maker? Everyone is decision maker, including us. By everyone sharing your knowledge, experience, we actually inform each other decision on what we will take in daily life, in our work, in our research, in our engagement, in our speech, in our decision whether we come here or we stay home, you know. And today, why we are here? Next, please. I just want to highlight the reason why when we are in Alliance meeting, because we really want to invite everyone to engage, to celebrate being part of the Alliance. So our Alliance focusing on engaging with organizations that really believe that evidence can change the world in a positive way. So we define the organizations that work on this, not only traditional think tank, elite group of people, to the government, not only that. We consider any organizations and those who have really part of the process to generate the knowledge or use the knowledge, convey the knowledge, make the knowledge accessible to inform people, you know. And we would like to really see how much we really progress in terms of alliance establishment. Because everyone here contributes to the design of alliance for a year. And we open for invitation. And now who are in our alliance, we will learn today. And the second, we also would like to really see how we actually receive feedback from alliance member, what the alliance should do in the future, why we should stick together, what other things we should do together that benefit alliance member. And the third one is to really see how we can actually enhance the alliance in the way that we believe that it could help us to be more inclusive and in the way that influential, you know. So, and at the end, we want to make friends. We want to become closer. By this way, we can be really open and we can be happy together and we can be really sympathize to each other and really address the challenge that everyone needs to face in this world that some facts cannot be acceptable to some groups. But with collective effort, with many people, in the network, in the alliance, the voice will be better heard. Next, please. So, that are four objectives that we would like to cover in this half-day event. And let's see how many people attending this alliance meeting. We have more than 100 participants, you know, and very, really interesting in the way that uh, even we organize several events, dialogue, and forums many times. Someone that has been here 20 years. But majority, 70% are new. What does it mean? It means that we very welcome new family members. We are not only support like, uh, or engage with those friends who are already good. In the past, they may need some support, but now they've grown up. They do some other things. We welcome new member, new agent of change, who really keen to engage with us. And I'm so happy today we see many people, new friends. We see many from major university. And I saw my dear friend and fellows here. I saw two from Vietnam. So 
many friends, I'm very happy. And you see that we are very good in terms of gender balance. Next, please. And we also have all friends from the country that we focus attending these events. And of course, majority of our, us here, we are working academic and research institute, but I saw also quite good proportion that those who work on more advocacy engagement, including the government. So this is quite encouraging that alliance, not only those who do research, but actually those who need to use research for their work. Next, please. So because many of us here are new, I just would like to take some time, 10 minutes, to talk about what's really, some minute, what is really MTT Alliance. Start with really acknowledging that Mekong region is changing. We change a lot. Even ourselves, we change, right? The region also changed a lot. Physical change, societal change, we facing a lot of issues linking the climate, technology change, institutional change. Next, please. So there's so many actors in the region that try to address this, grab opportunities to see what are the positive things we can do together and address the challenge. So many mechanisms here, and we need to acknowledge our great supporters outside the Mekong region coming in and express interest. I can you help you in this, I can help you in that. Who they often talk with, they talk with the government. And there's so many regional mechanisms that try to make country working together. Talk with a friend from other country who come and believe that they can. Can you go back? Yeah, to make sure that they really kind of uh, work together for the country. But there's often concern that there should be more kind of voices and the need of people on ground to reflect that decision on taking like opportunities to develop or taking opportunity to cooperate with others, actors outside the region. So, and we need to acknowledge that there's so many regional cooperation mechanisms that led by civil society, non-government. And the concern is how this kind of different, either the government-led and civil society-led can reconcile and making sure that we actually reflecting the need in the region from the local and from the bottom, up, top, down. How can we work together? And I want to highlight the uniqueness of the summit and how coming here with the MTT would offer to the world, to the Mekong region, is we bring actors together. We can work with local communities. We can work with the government, intergovernment, international cooperation mechanism, financial information in state loops. So that's what we can work with. Why? Because we work based on the fact, we communicate based on the findings. Next, please. Summonet has existed for 20 years. Now I already mentioned SEI also 20 years. So in fact, Summonet just happened after one year of SEI established as Asia Center here. So we believe from 14 founding member that we, there should be, the region should have some mechanisms to inform the development decisions. And now we expand to include 800, more than 800 network member. What the direction the summit do is really up to the network member. Each theme, we ask what we should focus. We are very diverse. But what a core component and activity is we do research. We do engagement with policy. We address the issue of equity. We do actions. So that is always the core business of us. And we have so many projects and programs supporting this. And Summit for All is one, MTT is one. And thanks to CEDA, thanks to DFAT, thanks to many other, you know, thanks to every network member, it makes this Summonet as a network grown, grown enough to house the kind of family network. Call the first is Summonet Young Professional. We have many fellows. Can you raise again hands, the fellow? Can you raise hands? 
You are actually founding member of SumNet Young Professionals Network. This really because of you, your creation. Can you give big hands to yourself? <laughs> SumNet Young Professional born because of you. Okay, so now with MTT, we thought about someone that doing a lot of research. We should be more action. We should be really engaged me more. With support, strong support from this MTT, we are now creating MTT Alliance that work with the think tank, work with organization, use knowledge to influence the change. Next, please. So what's the difference, someone and MTT? You can see this. Circle in spectrum. Some of do research, inform policy, but core business is research. I would say we do 80%, 70% research, 30% engagement. Many actually action we do change the practice, change the policy, but it's not often like that. But we always have new knowledge. But with the work and with the existence of MTT, it helped us do further engagement. I would say 60 or 50 or 60 percent, we do engagement more with the MTT. This complementary action is make the synergy between Salmonet and MTT is really have great potential. Next, please. So this is the tree and it's the home that I mentioned earlier. Everyone here give fertilizers and give water to this big tree. And this tree is big enough, you know. It's grow high and it's grow wide. And it has new branches and it has fruit, you know. Some people who still want to maintain in the, this tree, you come and you make this tree growing. Some people say, oh, I'm graduate. It's your fruit. When your fruit like, drop down, you create the seed, you create the new tree, you know. But I would say if you continue work with the Salmonet, Salmonet could really offer you 20 years history, 20 years success that you can build on. You don't need to start from zero. You can climb up because we have a top way that we are open for you to climb up. And this is why we are hanging together and many members in the room here are founding members and thank you so much. You continue support Summonet until you here, 19 years. Maybe give big hands to our founding member. I think Dr. Singh, can you, Dr. Singh, Dr. Huan, can you stand? And Kun Andrew, please. Uh, I think we have several more. So if you engage from phase one, can you stand, please? I think uh, Madam Hamnawi also. Yeah, thank you so much. Because of you, we have this big family. And you're still here, you know. This is great. Next, please. Okay. So with um, MTT alone, next, please. With MTT alone, you know. Uh, can you move slide, please? Okay, so we focus on the sustainable development. Yeah. So here is MTT. We have different components of the work. We have the work on building the alliance. We have work on research, engagement, monitoring, and others. So this is really core business of us for the program. But these all contributing to long-term assistance of the network and alliance. Next, please. So only in the MTT alone, we are helping and supporting 11 projects. And many of our project teams here are present in our uh, room. I want to invite uh, everyone uh, working on a project. Can you please stand up? Flagship studies, rapid response, can you please stand up? We have more, I think almost 100, so please stand up. Okay. Yeah, that's great. We have a uh, really big thanks to you. <laughs> what you will bring this to this week is you come with the knowledge, you know. You face the problem. You work on ground, you collect data, you talk with policy actor. This is really the floor for the whole week that you will use rich knowledge and connection to convey to these events, not only the family and home here, but 
following day, we will have more people outside our network to join us. And we have like more than 100 people benefiting from the program. Next, please. But with the power of work in cooperation with the Summonet, we can help more than 300 people accessing to the grants, working more than 40 projects. You can see the locations that MTT and Summonet could spread in terms of the evidence and knowledge is across the region. You know, this is a power of cooperation. And I really feel proud and so happy to see this. Next, please. And, okay, this is a core topic that I was asked to speak. Alliance. And, okay, so we just invite people to join Alliance. How much we have now? How big we have or how small we have? Next, please. First of all, what is Alliance? I would like to explain this is a regional platform where we work with support and work with knowledge-based policy organizations to have an opportunity to exchange ideas together, learn from each other. And this is really core uh, work that we have and commitment we have. MTT Alliance is part of the Summonet, okay, family. Next, please. So, the next, please. So, we, so far, we have over a year designing stage. We ask our partners how Alliance should look like. Next, please. And then we actually now, just about two months, we invited. Now we have 37 organizations register officially as MTT Alliance members. So if you remember that you already registered, can you please stand up? 37 organizations, you know. Okay, so thank you. So can you give big hands to MTT Alliance? I know some people register, but you don't stand up sometimes. You know, this is often, whenever we send a request, I know some people don't even look at what is our request. You just say yes, you know. Many times like that, but yes, please, we have the list of organizations. Thank you very much for your trust. So we still welcome to have more organizations to join us. And now, of course, we have more Thailand and Vietnam, but we still would like to have more. Next, please. Of course, most of us here work on the research and we were recommended for many friends and currently we have midterm evaluations that we should really expand our alliance to work more, find more those who really work on civil society engagement, advocacy, and that's what we will do in the future. Next, please. And look at this. We have organization majority have experienced more than 20 years, more than 15, 20 years joining us. They really know the region well, and they like to be a part of us. We are so happy about this. Next, please. And we also welcome the new organization that started. You really like to join us, and we really hope that we will help your organization grow also. And 95% of organization here believe that they actually have common interests and also do some work linking with addressing inequality, gender uh, equality, disability, and social inclusion. So we have so much resources within Alliance to learn for. Next, please. The benefit of being Alliance, so of course, you will gain opportunities to access some funding opportunity information promote your work, access to the connection we have, and being part of Y branch Summonet Network. Next, please. Of course, benefit come with responsibility. What we are asking is not big, you know. We just ask if you can share information, knowledge you have, and in case any time we engage in the country that you're deciding, maybe can you please help us co-organize something, you know, and bring us and make friends for us and connect us. And at the same time, it's not really carry our brand. This is your own alliance. When you bring us, you bring your family and to introduce to someone in your country.
to make this like a Mekong more connected across the border. Next, please. So, in short, welcome to the Alliance meeting. And if anyone would like to learn more or have interest to join Alliance, please feel free to talk with me or talk with Kunbori Pat, you know, or other member in the Alliance. So we have here. Can I, I request the um, SEI Secretariat team? Can you please stand up? Please stand up. Okay, thank you very much. So, if you have interest to join MTT Alliance or anything about Summonet or anything about SCI, so please reach out to them, okay? And thank you for your time and thank you for listening uh, and welcome home many fellows and happy to talk with you in coming day. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Jayanis, for your introduction to the Alliance meeting, but more importantly, the hope and dream of all of, the, all of us for the uh, developments and future of the Alliance. So next, uh, very le relevant to our um, topic for today, uh, we have done um, the online survey for those who are interested in becoming the MTT Alliance members. Uh, as well as uh, MTT program have crossed its midterms and we have done the independent evaluation. So now I would like to invite uh, Mr. Agus, uh, MTT program manager, to share a key, fi key finding and recommendations on priority needs to enhance the capacity of the KPPIO from the region. Agus. Thank you, Nyan. Uh, welcome, everyone. So my name is Agus uh, Nugroho. I'm uh, program manager of the Mekong Think Tanks program. And like Dwight said, I'm also the son of the Mekong, I think. So Mekong has many sons. Uh, so uh, with the Alliance, uh, actually, we would like to have a more bottom-up approach. We don't want to kind of define what you need, but we would like to ask you what you need, actually, for developing your capacity for uh, you know, improving your effectiveness in terms of policy engagement and influence. So, but first, maybe we can understand ourselves. Uh, earlier, Dr. Chinese has mentioned about KBPIOs, knowledge-based policy influence organization. And we just, you know, uh, to trying to understand, uh, you know, how, how is uh, the expected role of these KBPIOs. So the KBPIOs are the entities that uh, primarily rely on generation and dissemination of knowledge and evidence-based knowledge to shape or uh, a public policy. So they typically conduct research. Sometimes they also get research from uh, different actors or stakeholders. Uh, then they do analysis also. They sometimes do uh, dissemination, communication of uh, recommendation, also advocacy in terms of uh, in terms of, uh, you know, what matters most in, for, for the region and also for, to, to kind of address the issues uh, in the region. That will influence policy decision at various levels, local, national, regional, and also international. So in terms of MTT Alliance, it is our interest that, uh, you know, our members within the Alliance, that we can grow up together, we can uh, progress together, to become more you know, inclusive and more effective in terms of uh, research to policy engagement because that's our core business. We are uh, producing knowledge. We are getting the knowledge across in the policy process to kind of impact the policy. So that's our goal, to impact the policy or practice. So uh, there is a question actually that we are trying to understand your aspiration, what you need, uh, the capacity, uh, building whether we need to do more uh, trainings or and what kind of trainings do we need? So uh, we use two basis, uh, two sources for the basis of analysis. One is the survey among the members of the alliance that was uh, run uh, between August and September, and then lately also we have a very valuable input from our midterm. 
uh, evaluation, which has, uh, you know, uh, quite independent, I would say, because it's, it's external to our program. So we hope that these two will inform us uh, in terms of uh, how we can, you know, uh, grow up together, how we can plan our, uh, you know, development of uh, the capacity within the, the alliance. So if you see the distribution of the alliance and the type of organization, we are a bit, you know, focusing on the knowledge generation, I would say, but we want to be strengthened in terms of uh, policy engagement, policy in communication. So maybe we can see that in the next uh, few slides. So in terms of specific activities within the alliance for the future, there is an interest to do more collaboration, more field visits, exchange of knowledge. Events, you know, uh, like this week, uh, actually this is our responsibility also as a, the secretariat for the MTT Alliance to create more opportunities for our partners, for our members to be uh, using this as a platform to engage with the policy process. Information sharing, trans transfer of experience, information access, knowledge management platform, that is very uh, crucial because we have many knowledge which is not systematically you know, uh, kept and managed so that many stakeholders can take benefit, can you know, draw from that knowledge. Of course, funding is necessary to create new knowledge, to explore new areas of uh, expertise. There's a new area like new ways like hackathons, for example. There is something to be explored, especially with the young generations. Maybe they're more familiar with that kind of, a, you, know, uh, you know, we come together, we solve an issue, and we, we produce something practical. Trainings or workshop, uh, as usual. And then we also identify more thematic uh, capacity building. There's a need about JETC for sure, uh, although like 95% of the organization within our membership of the MTT Alliance has already said that they do JETC, but there seems to be still a need to kind of uh, uh, incorporate JETC into the, the work. Uh, nexus, water, energy, climate, but also other kind of nexus, water, energy, food, for example, they are relevant to addressing, you know, uh, complex issue within the region. Climate, climate risk, resilience, adaptation mitigation, water security, economics, carbon market, for example, circular economy, green taxonomy, climate finance, land use. So this is something that, you know, a lot of aspirations, because we have a diverse membership, of course, there are many priority, there are many uh, focus, but what we are trying to do is here is to kind of draw all the needs uh, and then we can prioritize. But also we also try to also uh, identify skill-based capacity, the one that uh, will enhance more uh, of, of the, maybe the, the staff or the, the members within the organization. Um, such as research methods on how you generate knowledge. Um, the red one, the, the, the highlight in red, actually uh, it's identified by our, the findings from our midterm evaluation. So for example, there is a need for uh, the staff or the, the, the employee of, of our members on learning how to do policy research, how to you know, analyze policy, research writing, Communication, policy, uh, in terms of engagement, stakeholder engagement, research to follow, policy influence, very core in our uh, alliance. Engagement in terms of community, multi-stakeholder deliberative tools. But, you know, surprisingly also, our uh, evaluator also identified project management as one area that needs a lot of improvement in terms of coordinating projects, leadership, strategic partnership, financial management, administration. This is something that we can explore and we can prioritize for the future uh, capacity, enhancing capacity of our alliance. So, but, you know, there are many things, but we need your input. So I want you to grab your mobile phone or 
if you have laptop open, you can also go to vivox.app and enter the ID. We want your input on how to prioritize these things. So we want to have more, you know, again, bottom-up process, right? So we have your inputs, but there are many inputs. They are diverse. So we just want to get the sense of how important these things and, and see how the Alliance can address uh, this in the coming months, you know. Uh, and we still have about a year of, uh, towards the end of the MTT program. We will try our best to kind of deliver those, uh, you know, uh, enhancement to our capacity. So if you uh, already log in to the vivox.app, can you please load the... Yeah, okay. So, okay, so are you ready? Can we start the first poll? Login? Okay. Okay. First question. So you can see on the screen, you can, you know, uh, uh, pick the top three. Just pick the, the, the top three that you think it's most important for you. Okay. We have 64 signing in, but we need, still need more, you know. You see that numbers is going up. So please prioritize for us. Can we show the result? Real time, stop. Yeah, so you see. So more needs on the collaboration, field vis visits, exchange programs. Okay, you still can prioritize, help us prioritize. There is no need for project management, no? Capacity, right? I guess not. <laughs> okay, can we uh, move to the next question? You can still, yeah, okay. Stop, okay. The next one is on thematic capacity building. Which one do you think uh, you know, you would like to, you know, for us alliance uh, to deliver. For those online, I think you can also join. Just uh, follow that uh, QR code and also participate. The same with the in person. Oh, climate, okay. Nexus, number two. Jetsi, number three, very good. <laughs> okay, can we... Next, poll. So this is skill-based capacity. So please also help us prioritize on this. Uh, I think, just think about, if you are representing organization, just think about also your organization's need, you know, how to, you know, what, what would you like to see in your staff or in your uh, team members that you need to equip them? Research methods. Oh, project management is here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's good to see here. I thought it was in the first one. Okay. Wow. Very good. Very interesting. 
policy stakeholder engagement i think this is our core business so i think it's good to see them out, the, the 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 topic there up there but research yeah i mean it's understandable because most of us uh, 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 actually generating knowledge through research so that is good to see okay can we stop and switch again Okay, so uh, lastly, if there are more capacities that are, they were not captured by these two uh, survey and our evaluator, you can add uh, in this uh, free text, so you can type in, but also you can like, if you see uh, other participant already suggested a good idea, you can like also the, the suggestion. Can we show? Data analysis, okay. Communication, modeling and forecasting, very interesting. Okay, keep them coming. Because I think, I think uh, although this is like free text and you can just uh, offer any ideas, we can also see how they fit within the, 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 the previous section where we do uh, thematic, when we do uh, capacity, uh, skill-based capacity. Oh, I see MEL there, it's really interesting. Okay, so we wait. Okay, if, okay, last opportunity, three, two, one. Okay, thank you very much for your participation. So I think, uh, can we bring back to the slide? Okay, thank you very much for your input. Uh, you know, you can reach me uh, anytime if you, uh, you know, you'd like to know more about this uh, plan of our alliance and we can for sure we'll uh, connect with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Argus, for the very informative and integrative uh, section. So the next one will be exciting. Uh, we would like to invite um, four speakers who are from, uh, who will present to all of us for lessons, cases. Um, they has been our consortium partner. They has been our Summonet uh, members. They has been our grantees uh, and um, beyond that. So I would like to invite Dr. Reedy, uh, SCI Research Fellow, we will present a case study from one of the projects under Summonet for All uh, program. Uh, I would like to invite Dr. Peck Day, uh, the co-chair of Summonet Steering Committee, uh, to present his uh, insight and experience from uh, Red Plus Policy Influence in Cambodia, Myanmar, and Thailand. The third one, I would like to invite Dr. Jiranuk from Thailand Environment Institute for a topic more on the private sector to promote sustainable development. And last but not least, I would like to invite Dr. Lon uh, Bidara from My Village organization. Uh, he will be sharing his experience and lesson from how to engage with ethnic minor, uh, minority groups 
Um, and to moderate this section, I would like to invite uh, our MTT Component 1 co-lead, Dr. Sin, um, and also Ms. Thuy. Uh, she's our MTT Fellow uh, from Vietnam Women Academy. Um, can we have one more chair on the um, stage, please? So I will hand it over to uh, Dr. Sin and Tri. Uh, the floor is yours. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Mark Sin, and I'm very pleased to facilitate this uh, session. And without further ado, uh, please, uh, Dr. Shushi Rashi, uh, you, your floor is, uh, and you have uh, five minutes uh, to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sin, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, really appreciate this opportunity to share what we have been doing under Summon at Phase 4, which was focusing more on reducing uh, water insecurities in Mekong. It's a challenging task to actually sum up what we have been able to achieve in the last five years in five minutes. So um, my, this talk um, is based upon the synthesis that we have conducted based on the findings, the project reports, the policy briefs that have emerged out of different grants that we have provided under Summonet for All. So this work has been co uh, led by one of our Summonet fellows, uh, Kengsu. So thanks to her also for supporting this work. So in the next four slides, what I'm going to do is first talk about what has been the mission of Summonet for All. And the following, in the following three slides, I'm going to talk about three key elements that we focused on and how different projects and our experts from the region, the Summonet grantees, have contributed to each of those, um, namely inclusive planning, knowledge co-production, and also JETSI. And my last slide would talk about what are the opportunities for the network from here on. So what has been the mission? So mission of Summonet for All has been to reduce water insecurities in the region by informing policies and practice through, uh, through collaborative research also engaging dialogues on the policy level and conducting you know, collaborative research which is more scientifically sound and also is informing innovation across the region. So what Samanet has been able to do in terms of inclusive planning. So our projects have contributed in a great way to mainstream participatory planning processes. So we have been able to uh, really work from the ground up. We have been able to uh, establish a holistic approach where we are, you know, engaging different stakeholders all across the spectrum, be it community members, be it CSOs, be it uh, local policymakers or regional level policymakers. So that has been a highlight of Summonet granted projects. And we have also been able to recognize how critical it is for women and also marginalized communities participation in decision making and also policy and planning. And through our projects, we have enabled their engagement and also their uh, feedbacks to be included within the policy designs. And also, and you see on the right-hand side that one of our breakthrough projects, which is participatory flood risk management, which has been led by Ajahn Yanyong, who's also here today. So we have been able to catalyze large funding and monitoring support to participatory flood risk management in Thailand. So that has been a key outcome from Summonet for All in its current phase, which would be ending in December this year. Despite all these uh, good points or, you know, the drivers that we have seen, the good work that we've done, there's still uh, gaps that we have observed. There is a lot of fragmentation in terms of governance mechanisms when it comes to water resources management in Mekong. There are context-specific issues, there are country-specific issues, there are you know, governance challenges across different countries, and also there's lack of uh, more streamlined consultation and feedback mechanisms, especially when it comes to integrating local voices into policy design and implementation. Next, what, have been able, what we have been able to achieve in terms of gender equality, disability, and social inclusion. Sadly, uh, last phase of Summonet has not been able to do much when it comes to the inclusion of disabled people, but we have strived forward and have taken leaps when it comes to 
gender equality and social inclusion. There has been a lot of capacity building. We have strengthened capacities of not only researchers, but also policymakers when it comes to issues like uh, gender and also uh, social inclusion within uh, water sector and policy planning when it comes to that. Also, we have worked um, across the region through a JIRA project, which is a groundwater integrated regional assessment where we have also made a case of how important and critical it is to ensure that there is equitable benefit sharing when it comes to groundwater resources management in the region. Also on the right hand side, one quote that I want to highlight is, one of our, is from one of our boundary partners who has been a female uh, working at a local, prevent, uh, local water resources department and she has been moved by the kind of knowledge that the project has imparted in her when it comes to the role of women in decision making. So these are some of the examples that we would like to highlight and how Samanet has been able to contribute to the change when it comes to water governance in the region. Just one more minute. So uh, next one that I want to talk about is knowledge co-production. So our projects have also fostered a lot of knowledge sharing and also uh, ensure that there is community engagement. We have recognized different forms of knowledge, be it local knowledge, traditional knowledge, or scientific knowledge. So we have tried to bring together and integrate all these forms of knowledge in different projects. And as you see, it is highlighted uh, on the court on, uh, on the right-hand side that you know our researchers and our uh, stakeholders and partners realize that there is power. The knowledge is all about power, and they're trying to build that power by including local communities and their local knowledge to inform decision making, especially when it comes to <coughs> hydropower decision making within the region as well. So that's also where we are, you know, trying to make change and also steer the kind of thinking and the kind of research that we are doing in the region. Also, we have empowered a lot of local voices through participatory action research. So now we are working ground up. We are engaging with communities to design those participatory frameworks, which can then be used for decision making. And quickly jumping on to the opportunities and skipping the gaps, I, um, we all recognize there's still a long way ahead when it comes to ensuring water, in, water security in Mekong. So from here, I would like to say we have to follow the S, Bs, and S, Es. So these are all about scaling, building, strengthening, and expanding. So we need to scale up the policy engagements where we are taking into account the, uh, the community-based research into more transformative uh, policy design and implementation. We need to build more capacities and more inclusive governance mechanisms where we are also accounting for the local voices when it comes to marginalized and vulnerable people. Uh, we also need to strengthen how we are interacting across the region and build uh, you know, uh, community-led water resource management in the region where community has that ownership through decentralized governance as well. Also, I would like to share that we need to expand uh, the forums, the collaboration spaces like this where we are today uh, to also ensure that there is, you know, a lot of knowledge exchange between different stakeholders, be it communities, be it CSOs, be it researchers, be it policymakers. I think I'll Stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you uh, for your very nice presentation. Uh, next, please, to the figure. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sings. I'm just waiting for my presentation. It should be coming up. But maybe while the presentation is coming, um, I also just wanted to say that this is actually an opportunity to share the work that I was able to do 10 years ago. Uh, during summer net phase three and that's why you can see like even the uh, logo was like uh, quite outdated i think Yan was trying to change the logo but i told him that please keep the original logo just to show that this is actually a really old uh, project uh, but not not old but i mean just to say that this is actually work that was a able to be conducted because of the support from Summer Net Phase 3. Um, so in this particular research, um, we were looking at the National Red Plus, which is, uh, stands for Reducing Emission from Deforestation and Frost Degradation Strategies in Cambodia, Myanmar, and Thailand. 
Um, in terms of the consortium, I was very fortunate to be able to lead the team from the university in Cambodia, but also a university in Myanmar, but also a university in, in Thailand, specifically the Royal University of Phnom Penh, uh, University of Forestry in Jiazen, but also the Kaset Saab University with the uh, mentorship from the UNDP here in Bangkok at the time. And I think maybe one of the interesting thing about the project is that we work very closely with the government that are actually our boundary partners. For example, uh, in Cambodia, our boundary partner was the Forestry Administration. In Myanmar, we work very closely with the Forest Department in Myanmar. And in Thailand, we work with the Department of National Park. Um, also among the team, uh, we have also uh, two young researchers. Uh, one was a MA student at the University of Forestry, Yezhen, and one was also a MA student at Kaset Saad University. How do I go forward? <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so the, the project at the time, we were actually looking at assessing the interactions between the government and non-government stakeholders, specifically civil society, indigenous people, local communities, and how they come together to produce policy knowledge that everybody would actually find salient, credible, and legitimate. So specifically in terms of, of course, it is still a research, so we were drawing from a knowledge system in sustainability science, but also political ecology. I'm not going to go to, into that uh, very detailed, but what we were trying to achieve at the time was uh, we were looking at how the National Red Plus strategy in Cambodia, Myanmar, and Thailand were developed and how stakeholders are brought together to develop these strategies. And specifically, we were looking at the safeguard information systems, the benefit sharing mechanism, the driven redress mechanism, and also how the Red Plus strategy is impacting local land use and policy practices. Um, of course, uh, it's a research, so we were doing a lot of the key informant interview, observation of the Red Plus policy processes in the three countries, but also a lot of the archive research, looking at a report from government and non-government. Okay, so this is just some of the pictures. It was actually very nostalgic to look back at 10 years ago and all the work that we were able to do. So these are just some of the... Uh, pictures from the work that we were doing, the dissemination that happened at the national level in Myanmar, in Cambodia, and also the presentation by our uh, MA researcher. We were not, we did not have the dissemination in Thailand because at the time Thailand was still not ready to actually have a national red plus strategy. I'm not sure where it is now, but uh, that's why you only see the dissemination workshop that happened in Cambodia and Myanmar. Um, some of the outcomes. Uh, of course, we produced quite a lot of outcome. I was actually quite surprised, but uh, what we would like to highlight was that I think the support that we received also from Summonet enabled us to do all of this. We were able to write articles, technical working papers, we have policy brief, press release, even one MA student thesis, communication, presentation at different events, but also uh, the, I think Summonet used to have this like most significant change story, so we were able to collect these stories from the government who were our counterpart at the time, and you can see here that a lot of the things that we have produced, we try to actually publish it in the different languages of the countries that we work in. We have publications in Burmese, in Khmer, and also in Thai. Um, so what are some of the lessons when it comes to uh, this project, particularly knowing that we were actually working very closely with the government uh, agencies. Um, I reflected on this, I think some of the points would be that uh, it's really important that uh, we as the uh, researchers have to connect the dot and make all the connections because at the time, 10 years ago, I was finishing my PhD and I was looking of course at the Red Plus strategy in Cambodia and I was also working for the UNDP at the time. Uh, I think the mentor that I was working with at the UNDP actually introduced me to someone that and thought that, okay, maybe you should put in a proposal to actually look at like how these national reply strategy are also being developed in Myanmar and also in Thailand. And then started to make all the connection, uh, talk to the people in Thailand, the different department within uh, Thailand, but also uh, talk to the different department in Myanmar, just to find like who could be our boundary partners to work with. And that, that actually did take quite a bit and I think something to also consider when Summonet or MTT is actually wanting to have actually all of these uh, policy connections that there need to be time allow for these like uh, connection to be made. Um, and also the other thing I want to highlight is that it needs to respond to 
the need of the policymaker because at the time all the three countries were in the process of developing these national strategies. So there is actually high interest in terms of trying to learn from what we can tell them when it comes to how these policies should be drafted. And I think you know, the point would be that it's important that we as researchers also are looking at questions that are of interest to us and we are just not doing that because it is being funded. So because like that would not sustain the energy that you would put into doing the research. Um, the other point uh, would be that it's important to have very meaningful and long-term relationship with the boundary partners and to build the trust because we do, at the end of the day, work with uh, partners that are government, so it is also important that we are transparent, we are respectful in the co communication coordination that we have with them, and to maybe the other point that might be interesting for uh, MTT Alliance or someone that uh, Mac network is to consider actually co-producing the outcome with the government partner. For example, we have several publications that we actually did with the government as co-author. And I think that really built into the buying that uh, the government actually have on the work that we produce. And you can see from the pictures that I was showing that actually the outcome from our research were actually discussed at the highest level possible when it comes to how the national uh, organizations are actually putting together these national Red Plus strategy, as you can see from the picture in Myanmar and Cambodia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, please, next uh, presentation. Thank you, Fikdi. I think you make my talk more easier because you cover about 50% of what I intend to say. <laughs> so I'm not going to repeat, but maybe just add a little bit there. So something that's missing. And to answer your question that where is uh, Thailand National Red Plus strategy is going on. Uh, three years ago, uh, Thailand Environment Institute and me, myself, we support the DNP to draft the National Red Plus strategy. And after three years, not only us, Another stakeholder that we consult also have the same question. Now, where is it? <laughs> Actually, it was in the hand of, um, uh, we heard that it was uh, submitted to the um, parliament or the, uh, someone else already, but uh, since we changed our government for quite a few times, so <laughs> I'm I, I afraid it has been lost somewhere. <laughs> Okay, back to my uh, topic. So I was asked to talk about policy and private sector engagement, but as I mentioned that, uh, you already covered some, so I will just add. I prefer two slides. Okay. So how to engage policy and private sector? So uh, almost 80% that you already covered. Okay, I add. So first, we need to make ourselves uh, being known how to sell our expertise, otherwise there are no room or no channel for us to engage in either policy and private sector. And we should share our knowledge and expertise, either in a pro bono or uh, with some service, and it is very important to understand their mandate, their need, and their limitation as well. Because from the last, um, uh, event, I said, we should speak the same language. It's like understanding each other needs. We cannot just push what we want into their, into their plate or their table. We also need to really understand what is the limitation of a policy maker and what is the expectation of a private sector as well. And one of the things is uh, our researcher, we are very aware that we need to keep our knowledge up to date. This knowledge is uh, updated every day. We need to keep up, if, especially if we want to talk with a private sector. They're always uh, one step ahead of uh, government. So we need to be uh, sharp enough to talk to private sector. Otherwise, we will, um, they will lose interest. And uh, one and another thing is that we have to work as partner, equal partner. Always, uh, some researcher sometimes look down at uh, people that we are engaged. Otherwise, uh, it's not going anywhere. Okay, sorry. And only give them some options. Not, there is no absolute answer or absolute solution for anything. Option is something that uh, we really need. 
the photo that show are uh, those two photo. The first one is show how to we engage with a policy maker through a forum, through a workshop and discussion, and the lower one, how we engage with a private sector. That's one of the CSR. Everyone aware of what CSR, uh, many private sector or big company, they want to do a CSR, but one thing that we keep in mind, at least uh, our organization, we don't do just one event. We need a long-term commitment from, from private sector. I tell with this small reforestation activity. We want to make sure they know how to propagate tree from a seed. Not just come and plant a tree, take photo, and that's it. So 170 staff of one private uh, company, they have to commit themselves in that way and spend like eight hours with that. Okay, one minute left and ash. You're so friendly, okay. This is lesson learned, I will be quick. So as I mentioned, private sector always think ahead. We need to be sharp and uh, keep up with them. And, but however, there's some knowledge gap between our researcher and uh, private sector or even policy maker as well. And uh, one thing that's quite very important, we just got this comment from uh, the deputy governor of Bangkok. When we talk to, to her, we try to, uh, what to say, get her political buy-in for one of our flagship study, urban, uh, urban heat resilience. She said, no more po uh, policy recommendation. We all know that uh, we are researcher. Policy recommendation is nothing. It's just to put in the shelf. But they want something more tangible. This is we need to keep in mind. Maybe their policy recommendation is already out of date. And we need more practical and evidence-based solution. I think uh, Dr. Shianit already mentioned uh, during her, her speak. So it's not going to, I'm not going to repeat it here. And uh, the last point is we need to open to criticism. This is very important. If we don't open our mind, we cannot communicate either with policymaker or private sector uh, in the most effective way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, uh, let's uh, listen to the presentation uh, from Dara. Dara. Please, please to, to the Dara. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, distinguished uh, guests and uh, participants. Um, I'm very honored today to share some of our, my, uh, my village organization. It's a non-governmental organization. We are based in uh, Stung Trang province along the Mekong River. And we, we got a uh, rapid response project from SSI. And uh, today we'd like to share our community action research on the topic on leveraging local knowledge experience from engaging with ethnic minority groups. So why community-based action research uh, important for ethnic minority group? As you know that uh, indigenous people, they live very far away from the town, very isolated villages, but near the rich resources, near the Mekong River, near the Rams Asai. But uh, recently, as you know, uh, dam construction along the Mekong River have changed the ecological change, especially on the flood forest, on the fishery resources. Uh, but the IP people, indigenous people, they're living in those affected villages, do not have capacity to document it, to conduct this kind of research. Uh, policy maker always say, please give me evidence-based uh, research uh, data to prove that this is affecting your local livelihood. So that's why my village have built the voice and uh, the capacity of the uh, indigenous people and uh, they can have uh, uh, confidence in raising their voice uh, through more evidence-based uh, research results. So, and finally, the, the indigenous people, they have the ownership of uh, their community resources. So what has MBI support community action research? First, 
uh, we have uh, formed community researcher group. We have criteria selecting indigenous people at, at the, uh, our village side uh, along the Mekong River, just uh, close to border uh, Lao uh, Don Sohong uh, hydropower dams. And uh, we select with criteria uh, villagers uh, without migration, uh, young uh, female uh, uh, indigenous uh, women uh, be selected mostly. They very engage with our research and we build capacity on uh, developing the tools and research methodology. After that, on step three, we coach them how to collect the data and, and then uh, the step four, analyze the data and report. Um, my village support uh, all uh, the data report analysis and step five, when we uh, collect all the more um, research-based results and uh, documentation, we present it at the national and local uh, at the policy level. So, so far, our My Village activity has support um, indigenous people conduct some uh, this uh, five uh, activity, uh, but we, we, we have doing more than this, but it's select five. Uh, first, we uh, indigenous people, community research, uh, conduct cross-boundary impact on river coast local chain. Uh, on flood forest in Ramal side, instant time problem on water level monitoring, uh, fish catch monitoring, and fish species identification. So with this kind of uh, research study, they build more confidence in talking with uh, community uh, at the commune level, at the district, provincial, and even at the regional level. And uh, we, I also support community uh, researchers to present their finding at the MOC summit meeting last year. So the, the MOC found out that uh, the study about the flood forest change uh, uh, due to the irregular fluctuation of the water level, and they accept it and they take action. They, they come up with a community field visit at the, along the Mekong River uh, from, uh, from Vietnam and Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. Yep. So the challenge is just community very limited as indigenous people. They speak different language. They speak their own language. They even cannot speak Khmer language. Yeah, they speak Khmer language, but their understanding Khmer language, Cambodian language is very limited. And we take time to uh, uh, coach them, we conduct a kind of research. And we need to come up with reflection after some data collection and research result. Uh, uh, documentation, we need to have a meeting with them. And with the documented uh, community research, they build confidence in, uh, and uh, they can talk more, uh, more, and uh, have more confidence. The, the more important thing for indigenous people is, is that they have, uh, they don't have any confidence in talking with the village, village chief. For example, when you're attending the, in the meeting with the village chief or commune or provincial, they cannot speak uh, because they they scare about they feel scared uh, so with the knowledge they can help and uh, with the documented they have a strong evidence base in uh, in hand they can more in in uh, confident in speaking with those uh, stakeholders so i think thank you for your listening yeah thank you so thank you for uh, your keeping the time as we expected but now we have some time for our discussion and uh, challenging question that, uh, but first of all, I would like to express my very interesting uh, listening, listening to the four different distinct cases where we can see how the scientific uh, community can communicate and co-produce the knowledge with different partners, including the first with the academic research institution, secondly with business co community, uh, and Last but not least, with the local uh, organization, like grassroots uh, organization. So it is interesting to see, and, but the next question is, how can we replicate this kind of lesson learned across the country, but also upscale it to at the policy level? This is something that I, I would like to highlight that, that we might discuss around this kind of question. So now let's uh, take some time to have your comments, suggestions, please. Can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chu Tai Huang. Uh, I was the former chair of steering committee 
of Sermonet, and I am now the advisor of MTT Component 2. Okay. Thank you very much for sharing the interesting four case study. Uh, I have a, a comment and a question on fact and a suggestion. Uh, I see that in all the study, we are a little bit quite ambitious to have an influence on policy. We want to have a big change in policy. But in fact, we may not have a big change. And my question is that when we analyze in this case study, do we have analyzed government or public know the problem? And do they know the need of change in policy or not? We don't consider that. We just say, oh, we need to change the policy. But we don't consider government or public know about this problem and they need the change or not. And if the question is no, then we start the process of make a warning to them. And that takes time. And if the question is yes, they know the problem. Then they know the need of change. Why have not changed? And I found that there are five reasons, possible reasons, why they don't change. First, a group of decision makers get benefit from current policy, and they don't want to change. The second is that the pressure of the change is not strong enough, so they don't change. The first is not sure that the change is better than the current policy. That is a case study. Do we have a good evidence to show that the change is better than the current or not? We just have one case study, how we justify that our system is better than the current and it should be changed. That is not enough. And the four, is that the process of change is too complicated and take time. Sometimes people say that, oh, so we don't need could change. You, could you please okay. shorten yeah. your yeah. questions? Please. The, we don't change. And the four is the conservative opinion. People say that, oh, the own law or current policy good enough, why we need to change? So, and the last one is, uh, in principle, policy could be good, but cannot be applied at local level. Therefore, the, sometimes we complain about policy, but in fact, policy improvement says that policy is good, but the application is not good at local level. So, in our case study, we always complain that policy is good, need change but we don't analyze why have not been changed. I propose that, please consider that and put that in your report to show to the government. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Huang. So I think uh, given the limited time, uh, I would like to suggest that if you uh, raise the question, just be short and precise and just keep the, explain to the, uh, to the right presenter, away. please. Uh, Dr. Uh, you want to respond to Dr. Huang? Im Im no, I think his, his, points, his points are very good. Um, I think he made four points, but I think I will just try to respond to two of them. Um, I think it is, I agree with you that when we talk about like influencing policy, we have to be very specific. What do we mean by influencing policy? Are we trying to change the policy, as you said in your last point? Or why do we need to change the policy? Is it not good to begin with? So I think that's why it's important that as researchers, of course, we are always asked what is the policy implication of your work, then we also have to take back, take a step back and actually reflect like what exactly that we are trying to do with the policy. For example, like in my case studies, we are actually trying to write a new policy which doesn't exist. So then there is actually a lot of incentive for the government to cooperate with us because they do want to have this strategy for other purposes to get funding from the UN Red or from the World Bank 
so there is a need from the policymaker for us to actually produce things that can be turned into a policy. But that, of course, doesn't happen in all cases. I think it's also very unique that at the time I was just in the right place at the right time to be asked to do this. But of course, in regular cases, it is important to reflect on the points that he raised that what exactly is the research team able to do when it comes to policy. Um, of course, answer will depend on exactly what you are trying to do, but I think it's important to reflect and be clear what the research project that you are trying to do would be able to uh, do when it comes to policy influence. And then uh, the point about, of course, like uh, we see like we make a lot of recommendation, but it doesn't lead to anything. The policy never change. Why, why is that the case? Um, actually, even in the research that we were doing in the three countries, for example, like uh, uh, Dr. Gerard mentioned, we did a lot of work with the Department of uh, National Park that we produced a lot of inputs, but it's just that the bigger context of the country, for example, in Thailand, as you mentioned, the government changes quite often. So then uh, the input doesn't really get too far into actually drafting the national red plus strategy in Thailand, just because the bigger context is just beyond our control. So that's why that doesn't really lead to anything. But even in Cambodia, where uh, we made a lot of progress with producing a lot of the policy brief and so on and so on, at the end of the day, actually, to be honest, a lot of the work that we actually have produced did not actually make it into the national red plus strategy in Cambodia itself. And that's because of the politics behind it, because of the people that are behind it actually negotiating for very different perspective than what we actually have. Actually, we write about this in a paper in sustainability science that you can actually, uh, I can share the paper that actually talked about, despite all the good collaboration that I have shared in the presentation, a lot of the input that we provided did not make it into the final document that made the Cambodian National Red Plus strategy, just because of the politics behind that. Thank you for your very precise response to uh, the Dr. Huang question. Can we have another audience uh, comment? And please, uh, uh, Dr. Yuan Yun. Thank you, Dr. Singh. And uh, I, 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 I'm really impressed with uh, Dr. Lon. No? from Cambodia that, uh, uh, can, can I share my experience with, uh, please, uh, please. I, I, that short, I, I, I'm very impressed with the sign, kind of, kind of citizen sign stuff. And uh, from my direct experience in Ban Pai, as Dr. Riti uh, mentioned that, uh, uh, we bring in a kind of citizen sign to build or empower the community to manage themselves to so those extreme even. Uh, it's, it's okay, it works. Believe in them and kind of support local government to kind of again to build those community, you know, kind of strengthen them to do it. And that's, uh, and um, you know that this day or this week, Chiang Rai and Chiang Mai in this country got a severe flood. Severe flood. What happened is that in Chiang Rai, devastated people lost, you know, many those minority lost their properties, their land. Many things, no. In contrast to that, in Chiang Mai, in Chiang Mai, I would like to focus, no. People prepare for, prepare to that for the, even ahead of time for weeks. You know, the community groups come together and agree to move the patient, the vulnerable group, out of that zone. So, so that help a lot, you know. That citizen sign, let empower the, the, the people, the local people, I mean the community actually said, it's, you know, it's a good one, you know. And even the kind of upcoming idea or concept of nature-based solution, no? that will be a, the key for, for this trade, I think. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang Yut, for your very uh, insightful uh, sharing. Uh, we have heard about our experience, how we deal with the uh, our uh, 
scientific community, uh, what we call not, uh, it's more traditional uh, mainstream uh, research. And also we work, uh, we had on this discuss how we can work with the, what we call citizen side. I want to learn a little more about how you communicate, how you deal with this business sector, because this is something we would like to hear a little uh, along this uh, aspect. Thank you. This for the audience. In, 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 the, in, the, in the time of the time uh, limit, uh, we might have one or two more questions, and then we can uh, uh, close the session, please. If you have some uh, other, then, then, then you could please. But I would suggest that, can we discuss a little bit about our our uh, the way we cooperate with the business uh, community, the, the sector, private sector. Is there some comment, some insightful sharing experience? If not, then we can share other other aspects. So please, you have uh, like time for one or two more questions. Please, the lady up there. Could you just? Pick the, the microphone. Uh, uh, so uh, thank you for a very uh, my, uh, insightful uh, session. So I really have one question related to the Red Plus, because I see that you're working with uh, three different countries. So I would like to know um, what framework that you use to uh, successfully engage all the three countries to develop these uh, policies and. Also, if there's any challenge behind the successful story. Thank you. Um, actually, we have a lot of challenges. Because <laughs> like, uh, within the five minutes that I was given, I'm just going to highlight all the good things. <laughs> but, there, but there were a lot of challenges, for example, like from very administrative to uh, financial to actually research that can be done. Uh, for example, like the field work in Myanmar was very challenging because of the situation. Um, the lack of the policy progress in Thailand also impact a lot on the work that we were able to do. So th there were actually a lot of challenges. Uh, of course, like the picture I presented was very nice. <laughs> but in terms of like how to organize all of this, I think uh, one of the things that I would say would be that uh, we all in a team that came with very specific interests that we, we share, which is uh, how do we contribute to the drafting of this national strategy in the three countries that we are from. For example, like uh, I was also involved in the drafting of the national strategy in Cambodia. Uh, Dr. Surin was actually involved in drafting the safeguard strategies in Thailand. Uh, Dr. Tin Min Muang in Myanmar was also engaged quite a lot with the Forest Department in Myanmar. So we all share the interests. Uh, so it was easier to, to coordinate because we all have that responsibility in our respective countries. That's why uh, my first point in the lessons learned is that uh, the funder always asks the researchers to have these policy impacts, but not enough time actually, we would say, is actually given to us to actually make all that connections. Uh, in a way that is actually meaningful, that the government counterparts that we are willing, that we are going to try to work with is actually willing to work with us. So I think the lessons that I would really like to emphasize actually for the funder to really reflect in terms of what you really are asking for the research communities and is the time frame, the resources that you are willing to put into funding all of these activities allow you to allow them to actually have these impacts that you want to have them make the impact. Okay, I think uh, finally we will uh, end our session and I would like you to join me to thank all our excellent presentation and then uh, we will uh, finish the session. So, so again, highly appreciate for the valuable and wonderful presentation and also a very warm time for the question from, from audience. So hope, um, even we close the uh, presentation here, but uh, hope after we uh, have break coffee, we still like this skirt and ask uh, some author about some uh, interest research or we sharing experience. And even you can connect by them email and for other networking. Okay, again, thank you a lot. Thank you very much for our panel. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sinentri, for hosting the uh, section. So uh, now I would like to invite everyone for like a very uh, quick group photo. Um, our
photographer will be staying on the stage. I would like to invite everyone to come closer on the stage and fill in this space in front of the stage so that our photographer will take the photo from the stage downward. Um, okay, uh, more detail. Please stand up. Move forward. Come closer, getting more cozy in the center. Yeah. Um, shorter people will come in a more front. Taller or the one who can jump will stay a little bit in the back. Come closer. Yeah. Can we turn on two of the TV with the background, please? Yeah. Uh, can we get more closer? Uh, Kungate, can you stand on the stage to take a photo downstairs? Um, can you... Yeah, yeah. Can you squeeze a little bit? Squeezing a little bit. Uh, yeah. Squeeze in more. Okay. Um, okay. For the people who try really hard to get seen, you can move to the front. We can fill in this space. No need to fill in this space. Feel free to lie down to sit up. Can we have Karen, Siswile, and Rajesh to come closer with us? Yeah, getting squeezed in. So we have to cut it uh, here. So the one who uh, left, really move to the other side. We have more space here. Uh, twice, can you come uh, closer? Okay. We Photoshop you in. Okay, just jump when we say on count to three, okay? Boribat, Dr. Pomisai, really? Squeeze in, 